So we're here for the second video in the series uh, talking about K18. And in the first video, we looked at some CW measurements where we had signals that are, have amplitude variation only or bandwidth variation only. And we learned that it was possible to do AM to AM, AM to PM and frequency response measurements using each of those individually. But in addition, then, if we took a fully modulated signal, it was possible to do all measurements at the same time. So in the second video, we're going to look at some more details around K18. And again, I'm uh, here with Florian. And uh, yeah, I guess I'll hand over to Florian to introduce what we're going to talk about today. Thanks, Darren. So hi there again. Um, as Darren mentioned, this time we're going to talk about modulated measurements. We'll do a few different analysis on a modulated signal and we'll try to sort of figure out what are the differences when we analyze the signal in the amplifier option, the K18, versus what we do today is a single carrier signal. So we'll also look at the K70, the VSA option. Um, we finished the last video with a single carrier signal. I think we had a 100 mega symbol signal. And today I just want to pick up the same signal again. So as you can see, we have a modulated signal. It has bandwidth, it has amplitude variation. And with that, we'll go into K18 and have a closer look at that. This is pretty much the view that we finished off the last video with. So we have 100, roughly 100 megahertz wide signal. And we have an AM AM plot and an AM PM plot. And what we can see is it's pretty much in the linear range, although the, the upper samples here, they start to get some, some phase variation on it. We also have the frequency response plots active and we can see it's, if we zoom in, yeah, has some slight variation roundabout to dB. And that can be pretty much anything. It's um, mismatch between the instruments and my device and the test, and it could be also an influence of my test setup here. Um, speaking about the test setup, it's pretty much the same as last time. An SMW driving our demo, demo amplifier and the demo amplifier going straight into the FSW. Right. So this is what we did last time. And now we'll have a look at the result summary in more detail. Um, probably the number most people are looking at when they do modulation accuracy measurements is EVM number. As you might have noticed, it's not called EVM in K18, it's called raw EVM. And this is a very important thing, as we will show, it correlates very well with a real EVM, but it's some, something completely different. The raw EVM in K18 is evaluated on a sample basis without any knowledge of the modulation type. So all K18 does is it compares sample by sample the, the measured signal, what's going in into the RF port to the reference signal that we have previously queries from a generator or loaded to the generator. And on a sample by sample basis, it directly calculates the classical EVM. So it does the vector difference and calculates the magnitude of that. So for this example, it's round about in the order of 2.3%. Now, is there any additional way in K18 on how we can analyze the error vector? Yes, there is. There's two pretty interesting displays, one of them being the error vector spectrum, which basically tells us where about in the spectrum we have more EVM and where we have less. And then very interesting for an amplifier, we can also plot the EVM versus power. Obviously, once we drive the amplifier into compression, we would expect 
that the EVM concentrates up here for the higher levels. As I said, right now the amplifier is, well, pretty much in the linear range, which means the EVM is sort of, well, equally distributed here. Of course, we can also look at the EVM versus time, which in case you have some thermal or drift effects could be shown there, but this is not what we want to focus on today. All right, so looking at the numeric results, we have an, an EVM of around about 2.3%. As I said, we have a single carrier signal and probably the next question coming up from a customer is, where is my constellation diagram? We don't have any in the K18. Why is that? Because K18 has no clue what the modulation in this signal is. It only knows the individual samples of the reference signal, but it doesn't know anything about modulations. So in case someone needs a constellation diagram, we will have to go into K70. So I have configured K70 already for this uh, 64 QAM signal. The first spot is going to be on the EVM value being calculated here in K70. As you can see, we have around about 2.1, 2.2% here in K70. And if you compare that to K18, the 2.3%, this is very close. And it's very important whenever we show that to point out that it's a very good correlation and typically they are very close, but it's not the same. It's simply not the same. Again, in K18, we compare sample by sample. So Florian, you mentioned that it's simply not the same and we know that there's multiple methods of measuring um, EVM. So you've, you've said here, for example, that the correlation looks the same as K70. We, we also know that 3GPP, for example, defines exactly how you need to measure EVM. Um, are there like maybe other methods that this is very similar to? I mean, I, I guess that there are methods also using network analyzers that this is quite similar to. Yeah, actually, that's a very good question. Um... Speaking about the, the VNA-based analysis of EVM, it's very clear that, well, the VNA-based methods clearly can take into account nonlinear effects, it can take into account frequency response effects. But as soon as you have any EVM effects resulting from, from a time-dependent behavior, it cannot um, visualize, measure, or measure them. Clearly, the VNA does measurements in the frequency domain and then transfers or translates them back into the time domain and calculates an EVM. Whenever we do a measurement here on the spectrum analyzer, or I should say signal analyzer, we always capture a time domain signal and we calculate EVM over whatever we captured over time. So any, any effects present during our capture time we will, or will be included in the EVM. And time-dependent effects can be thermal ones, like if you have a burst signal. Um, a very common one is, for example, a droop over time of an amplifier. Um, if you wanna measure those effects, I can clearly recommend to do a time domain capture, not a frequency domain capture. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. Um, I guess it's something that maybe people watching the video might be thinking about in terms of the different methodologies. I think that the important point is there are different methodologies to calculate EVM, but um, we should be aware of what each method can and can't do. And there are differences between them. For sure. So going back to the differences between these two methods we're looking at at the moment in both working and time domain. As I said, K18 or the amplifier personality 
it compares sample by sample. If I have a large overset, oversampling set up here, I, will, I have a lot of noise contributing to my EVM. So what do we do in case 70? In case 70, we know the symbol rate, we know the shaping filters, and we know the constellation type. And typically what K70 does is it calculates the EVM only at the symbol instances. So only look at the symbol instance and calculate the difference between measured and the reference signal. Now, before we go a step further and change our setup so we'll see some additional differences. Um, I just wanna quickly stop again and have a quick look at, at one feature being the equalizer. As I mentioned, we had a quick look at the frequency response. We have a little bit of frequency response in our signal. And obviously, Many of our measurement personalities, like all the standardized wideband personalities like LTE, 5G, they have a built-in equalizer, which flattens out the frequency response. And they simply have that because the standard um, asks for, ask for it. And the standard asks for it because the typical receiver in LTE, it has a built-in equalizer. So it does make sense to measure EVM when the equalizer is present. In K18, what I have to do is train the equalizer and turn it on. And as you can see, the EVM decreases significantly to less than half a percent, which in return tells us that most of the error that we see in the EVM comes from the frequency response. Now let's do the same thing in K70. And as you can see, the result with equalizer on again is very, very similar. 0.4 something and 0.4 something percent, which is good, but let's keep in mind, the correlation is very, very good but the EVM numbers, they are not the same. All right, I'll turn off the equalizer for a moment again. In the next step, what we wanna do, because we are looking at an amplifier, we wanna drive it a bit harder, a bit more into compression. So I simply increase the drive level. You can see the EVM going significantly up to above 10%. One thing I wanna show you, if I train the equalizer again and turn it on here, you can see there's still some contribution from frequency response, but it's, it's, it's by far lower now. So even with the equalizer on, we still have almost 10% of EVM. Why is that? As I said, we're driving the amplifier harder now, and basically what we see is nonlinearity. It's very obvious if you look at the AMAM or AMPM plot, yes, there is significant nonlinearity. Also, if you look at the spectrum, you can see the shoulders causing the ACLR. And as I previously promised or mentioned, um, if you look at the EVM distribution, over power, you can see EVM is sort of focusing here on the high power range. It goes even up to very extremely high numbers, like almost 100% here at the peak power levels. Right, so why am I showing this now? We'll go back to the VSA in a second, 
but before that, I want to just sort of ask the question, what do we expect to see there? Do we expect to see a very similar EVM or do we see, do we expect to see something different there? All right, let me just quickly turn off the equalizer. All right, so equalizer is off. And what we see is, I would say a significantly, significant different number in EVM. It's around, well, somewhere around eight, eight and nine percent, where we had 12 and a half percent in K18. Why is that? Um, as you can see in the constellation diagram, we have a lot of decision errors or symbol errors. Because if you draw the line between the individual symbols where we make the decisions for either the one or the other symbol, you can see that in many cases, for example here, it's obvious that we will get wrong decisions. If we get wrong decisions in K70, it also means that our reference signal, which we derive from the demodulated data is wrong. And if the demodulated signal, the reference signal is wrong, then obviously the EVM is wrong. So whenever we expect to have symbol errors, the EVM in K18 is better or is, is the right reading, whereas in these demodulation-based options, it is possible that the EVM EVM number displayed is too low. A workaround that you could do in K70, of course, is the known data approach, but we're not going to focus on that here in this video now. So summarizing the EVM, as I said, it's what we call a raw EVM, and it's not exactly the same as, for example, in the K70, because we do it on a sample basis, basis rather than on a symbol basis. However, since we have the real reference signal, because we download it from a generator or we load it from a file, we always know what the correct reference is. And therefore, the EVM in K18 is always, let's say, correct, even in, uh, environments where we have a very strong compression or if you go to the other direction with low power levels, the same thing with symbol errors happens if you have a very low signal to noise ratio. So if you have an environment where you expect symbol errors to occur, K18 is one way to measure the true EVM. Briefly mentioned the known data approach in K70, which also works. But um, in K18, there is no additional switch that you have to turn on before you get the true EVM reading. And with that, I guess we have covered a very important part of the EVM measurement. And also, I think we highlighted the differences in EVM measurement between the measurement in, in K18 and K70 compared to K70. And I think this is a good point to wrap up this video. Okay, great. Thanks, Florian. I think it's fair to say we also touched on slightly the differences between the VNA approach and, uh, and what we see in K18 as well. And I'm sure that's something that we're going to go on to a little bit more detail in the next videos. Okay, so um, thank you for watching. We'll leave it there.